through another dimension. An area not only of sound and ideas, but light. You're taking a journey to a land without boundaries, where diversity rules. A dimension that is both multicultural and intergenerational. You are moving into a field of empowerment and expression. You are crossing into full circle. Welcome to Full Circle, your cultural and Affairs Radio Magazine. Last week on Full Circle, we explored different perspectives on death and dying. You can check out our archives at kpfa.org. This week, we explore Korean culture and expressions. On tonight's show, we'll explore the healthcare system in North Korea. Then we'll talk about the roots of Pungmul folk music. And also, we have a live performance of Pungmul here in the studio with drummers from the Korean Youth Cultural Center. We are your hosts, Gil Cho and Jacob Simas. Stay tuned. Throughout the past six years, we've heard all about the evil empire that is North Korea. There's the axis of evil bit and the crazy dictator who starves his own people. Then there's a missile and nuclear test that supposedly threatened the entire United States. But through all the rhetoric, we don't hear about what the country and the people are like. We don't know about their way of life under an entirely different social system. Well, we often compare the politics, cultures, and institutions of the United States with European countries we don't often think about comparing the systems and ways of the so-called hermetic kingdom with our own in order to see what we can learn. But tonight, Full Circle's Kyung Jin Lee takes us up close and personal to North Korea, and we get a rare glimpse at the healthcare system and how it differs from our own failing one. I recently traveled to North Korea along with eight other Koreans from the U.S. to promote peace in the peninsula. During this trip, I got a chance to learn about the country's health care system. Our delegation went to the Pyongyang Maternity Hospital, which opened in 1980 and was built to resemble a mother's arms cradling her infant. The floor was a beautiful mosaic of flowers, a symbol to encourage the birth of a vigorous and strong baby. The 2300-bed hospital also had dental and ophthalmology departments, as well as a steam bathhouse and physical therapy room in order to offer the mothers the best pre- and postnatal care that North Korea has to offer. Expecting mothers receive 18 regular checkups throughout her pregnancy, as well as four follow-ups after delivery. And if both mother and child are healthy, they can expect to stay a patient for seven days. The nationalized system of free care began in 1952 during the middle of the Korean War. For many Americans, this is a foreign concept. What would universal health care in the U.S. even look like? There are over 75 million uninsured and underinsured people in the United States today. Many are people who go bankrupt due to exorbitant medical bills, and there are also people whose simple ailments turn fatal because they could not get treatment. But for North Korea, the national system was designed for 100% coverage for its citizens. Dr. Kim Bong-ju, the vice chair for the Medical Doctors Association in North Korea, elaborates. Specifically, our country has a responsibility system, which involves one physician having primary responsibility for providing medical care to 130 to 150 families. In the morning, physicians make home visits, and in the afternoon, they provide treatment for patients at the clinic. The state provides initial checkups, diagnosis, treatments, and medicines, all for free. 
Our country is built on the principle of serving our people. Our great leader, Kim Il-sung, taught us that people come first and foremost. Therefore, all of the resources of the country are to be used to protect the welfare of the people. This is particularly true for public health. So we make sure to put priority in investing in public health. Sam Shin, an epidemiologist at the California Emerging Infections Program, talks about the difference in systems between North Korea and the U.S. For countries like North Korea, it's a developing country and its resources are limited. They would prioritize primary health care, making sure there's disease prevention, there's health education so that the population is practicing good hygiene and behavior that would prevent diseases, as opposed to focusing on providing a lot of resources for the curing of diseases. So if you look at the U.S. health system and um, look at where all its resources are going into, then it's primarily for um, providing diagnosis and treatment as opposed to trying to take care of disease at, at its early stages. Since the development of the health care system, North Korea built a central hospital in every province for specialized care, smaller hospitals in each county, and clinics for small villages for every citizen to utilize. Walking through the nation's preeminent maternity hospital, there were certain things that were new, like several computers and medical testing machines. But for the most part, the cleanliness of the hospital could not mask the need for new resources. However, Sam Shin said that until the 1990s, North Korea was among the leaders in health development. When the economy was still functioning, North Korea was able to achieve tremendous level of health outcome for its people. For example, life expectancy in North Korea was in the early 70s, which is pretty much comparable to the U.S. In fact, the vaccine coverage rate in North Korea for children under five far exceeded the U.S. and was near 100 percent. So these are all health achievements that the U.S., with all its resources, was not able to accomplish. Dr. Kim expands on pre-famine health conditions for North Korean civilians. Prior to the arduous march, 60 to 70 percent of the medicines that we used were produced in our country. In addition, hospital supplies were updated every seven years. The historic famine, what North Koreans call the arduous march, changed all that. With no basic resources like electricity or fuel and no assistance available, the country went into a tailspin. Millions of people were severely malnutritioned with 200,000 to 300,000 casualties reported. The famine affected every corner of the country. And you've all seen the photos. The children with stunted growth and haunted faces families forced to eat bark from trees and the continued flight of North Korean citizens migrating to China. North Korea is still recovering from the devastation. Since those days, things are still difficult, though the worst seems to be over. Two ways that North Korea compensated for the lack of medicines and resources was through utilizing traditional Eastern medicines, as well as working with international aid organizations. While Eastern medicine was always integrated into the North Korean public health system, they have greatly increased this practice since the arduous march. Dr. Kim Bong-ju, the vice chair for the Medical Doctors Association in North Korea. What we used to call Eastern medicine, we now call cordial medicine. I think the Kyoryo Hospital here in Pyongyang is probably the largest hospital in East Asia specializing in Eastern medicine. After patients receive their diagnosis using modern technology, treatment is given using both cordial as well as modern medicine. Depending on the patient's preference, the patient can choose modern or cordial medicine exclusively, or a combination of both. If the patient wants acupuncture or herbal treatments, we can use that and infuse it with modern medicines. We have also developed a way to make these traditional medicines into injections, capsules, and teas, which make it easier to use. And this has become very popular with patients. 
while North Koreans have had success with utilizing creative solutions for the health needs of the country, there is still a dire need for resources and materials to bring the overall level up to par with other nations. International organizations have played a key role in aiding this effort. Groups such as the UN World Food Program, World Health Organization, and UNICEF have provided relief to North Korea since the late 1990s. But many Americans believe that North Korea has remained obstinate and backwards about the conditions for this assistance. Dr. Kim refutes this point of view. Actually, we have maintained a good working relationship with organizations such as the WHO and UNICEF, and they were allowed access to assess the situation in our country. Based on their assessments, they brought in appropriate supplies and equipment to support our efforts. So the rumors that these organizations had difficulty gaining access is simply not true. We gave them access. We did, however, have problems with many of the other international NGOs. These NGOs demanded access to everywhere they wanted to go, yet provided only minimal amounts of medicine. We were not confident about the quality of the medicines that they brought in the first place. We didn't know what standards were used in their country to produce the medicines, and they brought in expired goods. Yet they demanded to go here, then demanded to go there. Last year, we gathered all the NGOs and told them that we no longer needed their medicine. Leave our country and go back. We told them, you don't bring a significant amount of medicine, but you go all over our country only to point your finger and criticize. Yes, we are going through a difficult time in our country, but it doesn't help for you to be an informant for your countries about the situation here. In my view, helping people in need is essentially the same whether it is for a family or for an entire country. Those who are helping should give what is needed, and the people in need should make the decision on using it the best way they see fit. As an example, let's talk about aspirin. The NGOs wanted to bring in aspirin, which is expensive to procure. A thousand dollars worth of aspirin from NGOs amounts to only a small packet, but in our country, if we were to have $1,000 worth of raw material, we have the capacity to make many more times worth of aspirin ourselves. So we tried to tell them that what is really needed in our country is the raw materials for aspirin. Access to raw materials would significantly help our health system. There is no doubt that North Korea has a long way to go in its recovery process. In July of this year, the country dealt with another round of catastrophic floods which reportedly killed and displaced thousands of people. However, there are still important lessons Americans can take from North Korea's health care system. Sam Shin at the California Emerging Infections Program. The U.S. can learn a lot from the North Korean health system. You know, there is actually a movement within the U.S. to try to reform the health care system so that the government provides health insurance for everybody. So the campaign is called Health Care for All. And this kind of model of providing health care actually was derived from the health care systems of socialist countries such as North Korea. So it's kind of a modification of providing a socialist type of health insurance as well as getting private industry to assist and making sure that, you know, 100% of American residents are eligible for health insurance. I think that'd be one huge step to improve the health system in, in the U.S. While the United States can boast the latest technology and advances in medicine, Access is the main obstacle for most Americans. For North Koreans, that is not the problem. Their health care system lacks resources to deliver quality care, but the system they built up has elements we can all learn from. And if we continue economic sanctions, deny humanitarian aid and resources, and argue about how to bring the North Korean state down, it's ultimately the people of North Korea who will continue to suffer through the rhetoric of politics. Special thanks to Sam Shin for production assistance. For Full Circle, this is Kyung Jin Lee.
thanks to Kyung Jin for traveling all the way to North Korea to bring us that perspective. If you are just tuning in, you're listening to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1. We are your hosts, Gil Cho and Mr. Jacob Simas. Tonight, live in our studios, we have members of the Korean Youth Cultural Center here to share the sounds of Pung Mu with us. Right now, our performance room is filled with people and various instruments, which we'll talk more about later. But first, why don't we hear some music?
If you're just tuning in, uh, you're listening to Full Circle. We're your hosts, Jacob Simas and Gil Cho. Uh, you just heard uh, two traditional folk songs known as Mongonpo Taryong and Penori, and they were performed by members of the Korean Youth Cultural Center, or KYCC, of Oakland. They are actually live here in studio with us tonight. Uh, we have a special guest, Elisa Kang, uh, Samuel Kim, performance artist Do Hee Lee, and Liz Suk. Uh, thank you so much for coming in tonight. We're actually going to talk with a couple of the members, Elisa and Liz. Yeah, um, Elisa Pumul uh, originated, as we understand, from agricultural villages where the community used music, song, and dance to wish for a bountiful harvest. Um, could you explain more about this and uh, also how Pumul historically and even philosophically was so important to Korean villagers? Um, so the Kore- a lot of Korean farming culture was um, built around a system called Tude, which was a system of collective farming in which a village would go from plot to plot and um, the whole village would farm one plot at a time. Therefore, everyone would be farming together at all times. They would share tools, they would share the harvest, and um, every part of that process was collective. And a main um, part of that was the drumming. It was used as not not only a means of celebration and um, to celebrate the harvest and um, mourning and other things that, such as um, rites, but it was also used out on the field as um, a way to make um, the work more joyous and more efficient as a way to keep the worker's spirits up. So the the type of drumming that we play, Pumul, is really um, comes from and it was really integrated into all parts of farming life. Great. Um, so Liz. There's uh, known to be a spiritual component to Pungmul, uh, particularly a Buddhist, uh, Buddhism is said to play a large role in the formation and development of Pungmul. Um, and sitting here just listening to that music, definitely that I can feel that spiritual and soulfulness. Um, can you actually briefly explain how religion helped develop, particularly Buddhism, helped develop uh, Pungmul? Well, both Buddhism and shamanism have its roots in um, in practicing and having a connection to the earth and to nature and so there's lots of elements to the drumming and to the singing that have those connections and rituals and rites that have connections to the earth and to nature and so there's elements like many of the outfits that we wear are similar to outfits that were worn by um, shamans and by Buddhist monks and in celebration and in those things many of that um, derives from there and of course there's this very collective feeling um, as you've heard us play and everybody that comes to our shows or comes and watches perform or has seen Pungmur played there's sort of this embodiment that you feel that collective spirit that um, Elisa was speaking about, that you feel this roundness and wholeness together that brings people together. And I think much of that is much of that is practiced in the rituals. So we stomp on spirits and we go through houses and we share and we mourn and we, we're, we share our joy and our happiness and our sadness together through music and that expression including about how do we overcome our oppression by the system. And also I I just want to say that the instruments themselves um, physically represent that connection to nature. Um, We have here today two leather instruments, um, two leather and wood instruments, and two instruments made out of brass and metal. And so they say that the leather and um, wood instruments represent the earth, and the brass instruments re- represent the heavens, and we, as playing these instruments, man is connecting the earth to the heavens and the gods. Well, we're sending some vibrations out tonight, and I think <laughs> it's going way up out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elisa, interestingly, the military is linked with mm-hmm. Pungmu. Yeah. And um, how did uh, how did the military influence Pungmu, or vice versa, and why? Um, well, there are a lot of um, little things such as um, when we play a full pankut, which is um, about usually around 20 to f- anywhere between 20 to 40 drummers standing with their drums tied to their bodies, there's a lot of formation, and a lot of those formations are derived from military formation. And um, just traditionally in the Korean military, the drums were always at the front, um, guiding and setting the tone and the beat and the rhythm for all the um, 
you know, military men. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so that, and also just even in our costumes, a little, some of our costumes, you see influence of just um, uniform like military wear. Also, that um, generally the Tude, the cooperative groups, would actually carry a banner to uh, represent their Tude, to represent their cooperative. And they would sort of go out and have these battles, drumming battles, you know, or they would play against each other and do those kinds of things. And those were very similar in action to military. That's really interesting. Um, So Elisa gave us sort of a small breakdown of the instruments here. But Liz, can you give our listeners a sort of uh, broader and more in-depth feel for these instruments? Because, you know, the limitations of radio, we can't actually... Part of the experience is just seeing you guys sitting on the floor here in a group. It's collective (laughs) and these beautiful instruments. Can you break down these instruments for us? Right, and definitely folks can see these instruments when they come out to our fall festival. So um, I'm going to have Tohi Lee play our gengari for us so we can get a sample. So that was the gengari, and as you can tell, that was a metal instrument. It's a small handheld gong that is played by the leader, the sangse, and that person plays um, the rhythm that everybody follows. And it's an important instrument because, one, as you could tell, it's very loud. We didn't need a mic for that one. <laughs> um, and it, it's something that resonates and everybody hears it. And that's the person who tells us when the uh, rhythm is changing and when, there was, when it was used in the cooperative farming, when we were going to gather together, when we come together and when we play together. We hear that and then we start gathering together. Um, so it's a really important instrument, and like um, Elisa said, this is one of the instruments that represented uh, the sky, the heavens, the wind, mm. um, the thunder, because mm-hmm. it's very, it just kind of, as you could tell, it's just kind of rolls in and just really crackles. Um, the next instrument is another metal instrument. is called the Qing. It's a larger Kong. Um, we tie it to a stand if we need to, or we hold it um, when we play in the punkut, but here's just a couple. And as you can tell, it's something that sort of wraps around the entire sound, and that's why it's so important. A lot of people think this is the easiest and the hardest, because if you hit it wrong, everybody knows. <laughs> um, and so the next instrument is the changu, which is an hourglass-shaped drum with two sides. And so that is um, made of wood and leather, um, and, um, and that represents the earth. And there's sort of a yin and yang side to the sound, and so one side is harder and a little softer to the other side as well. And it's also, <laughs> I'm getting instructions over here on the side, to add that uh, the changu is also sort of represents the sound of rain. Um, it kind of comes down, it's the most, plays the most complicated rhythms. Um, and uh, it's one of the first things that we teach at, at um, KYCC in terms of learning Pungmur because it's the basis of everything. Um, and then the puk, which Sam will play for us. So um, the puk is uh, uh, the bass drum, and it uh, it's, um, plays much more of the basic bass uh, rhythms. Uh, it also represents the clouds, sort of this, you know, omni- omnipresence that comes mm. through, right? And um, it's also really important. A lot of people think, you know, you don't need the bass, but it's really important because it gives us the foundation for a lot of things. Great. Um, the last question I had was... Um Actually, uh, open this up for whoever wants to an- answer. But um, how do you feel your own lives have been impacted or changed since learning about Bung Mul and practicing it and incorporating it uh, into your own everyday life? Um, in other words, how has it impacted your cultural um, consciousness as a person? Well, I think for me, um, I had, of all the players that are here, have been in the Bay Area the longest and have had connections to or 
had heard of Korean Youth Cultural Center um, from when I was in high school. And um, but because I had sort of wanted to, I don't know, I guess it was a little bit of internalized racism in those ways that you wanted to shun parts of your culture. And um, I felt like I couldn't find any other Koreans living in the United States that had similar experiences to mine or had similar views as mine. And I had met uh, KYCC at um, a drumming, you know, because they were on their way to anti-war march, the first one. And I was moved by that. And I found this community that really worked collectively. Um, and Pungmar has that. It has this collective spirit. When we've had people come to our space that just come there to learn for themselves, they automatically feel unwelcome. We don't say it, but there's sort of this, what? You know, we're here to build community, and that's mm-hmm. what Pungmar is about. And that's part of one of KYCC's core characteristics, which is to build this shared space where we can all learn and grow together. So I feel like that's definitely impacted me and helped me to reach back into my own roots and understand those um, ways that Korean people have risen up against the system together. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, Elisa, you, did you want to uh, give your kind of experiences about that? Um, I just would probably say that my experience with Pumo, I had learned Korean music in various other forms growing up in Los Angeles, but um, I remember one of the first things that I learned was when I was at KYCC and there was a lecture being given and someone said, if you want to know what Pumul is, Pumul is the music of the people. Mm. And to me, that's what it summed it up. Mm. And just the idea of the spirit and this idea of cooperative work and play um, was about the music of the masses and um, expressing that. So, Right on. All right. Collective work and play. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks for educating us on Pumul and its history. And um, let's get back to uh, the next song. I believe it's called Pilbong Pankut Nori. Oh, 
And you are listening to Full Circle here on KPFA 94.1. We are your hosts, Jacob and Gil. Um, I got to say, uh, if I'm not mistaken, chota means it's all, it's all good, basically, in the Korean <laughs> yeah. way. And I got to say, it's all good here. It's more than all good. The walls are shaking. We can feel the beat. But there's also this sense of reverence uh, to what's happening here. And it's really beautiful. Um, I just... I'm blessed. I feel blessed to be here. Um, you just heard more amazing sounds of Pungmo drumming uh, performed by members of the Korean Youth Cultural Center, or KYCC. Uh, we have in the studio performers uh, uh, Lisa Kang, Samuel Kim, uh, performance artist Do Hee Lee, and Liz Suk. Uh, a lot of you probably know KYCC has been in Oakland uh, since 1987 and provides not only a, a space for drumming, but a space for young people to explore Korean American culture, history, and identity. Uh, the Korean Youth Cultural Center has classes on traditional Korean folk singing, dancing, and music. Um, Liz, uh, we briefly explained just now what KYCC uh, does, but can you give our listeners more information about what you guys do as a group and you know how it formed and other uh, activities you guys uh, engage in? Uh, Korean Youth Cultural Center began in 1987 by 1.5 one and 1.5 generation Koreans uh, students who at the time wanted to show some solidarity as well as uh, join sort of the cultural movement, cultural resistance movement and democracy movement that was happening in the Korean Peninsula, particularly in South Korea in response to the political dictatorships. And um, there was lots of study groups and um, learning about what that meant and what it uh, reunification mean and what did these political movements mean as well as looking at culture and so you know we study at KYCC different elements of Pungmur but also other cultural aspects that we have like the folk singing and um, the dance and mass dances and things like that so we teach um, a beginner drumming Pungmur class um, generally on Wednesday evenings uh, right now it's been um, in hiatus because we're preparing for our fall festival, but we generally run that um, at least twice a year, uh, at least 10 weeks along. And so that's an opportunity for folks to come out and learn about Pungmur and understand its history, but also learn to play the changu, um and other instruments as well. And then um, in KYCC is a collective process, um, just like it represents um, in Pungmur, um, all our members have a say, a collective say in uh, what KYCC does, its direction and its mission and its goals and its visions. And so no one ever says yes to a performance without the entire group being able to say yes to it. Mm -hmm. And we don't make any uh, plans uh, without um, sort of a collective process towards that. And so KYCC has been a really stronghold for that and has been a place for uh, Koreans in the United States and the Bay Area to have a connection to Pungmur in Korea. Um, also, um, another thing that we do, like I mentioned, we do the Fall Festival annually, but we also do uh, Jishinbarki, which is to stomp on the spirits. Mm -hmm. And it happens at Lunar New Year time, and we, we can't go to every village and every house and visit every kitchen. So instead what we do is we go to Korean businesses in the Bay Area, particularly in Oakland, Berkeley, and San Francisco, and it's an all-day process, and we play and we sing and we uh, dance for business owners and uh, in the community. And we've tried to really connect ourselves with the different groups, like to the senior center and to the community center and things like that in order for us to really be what we say is to build community. Right on. Uh, you, you had mentioned that uh, stomping on the spirits. And for folks that aren't maybe right. familiar mm. with that term or the tradition, can you talk about that mm. a little more? What does that entail? Mm. Sure. Um, it's something that uh, literally to stomp on the spirits, it's uh, what happens when at Lunar New Year, uh, what happened was they would gather together in the village and they would uh, sort of stomp out the bad spirits um, for example, they would stomp around the well and they would sing songs and they would go to the, the tree, the big tree in the middle of the village and they would go to each house and bring good wishes. And so so the sangse, the leader, goes to the front door and then would sort of call out to the owner of the house mm -hmm. or to and say, you know, come out and uh, receive blessings. And so then the group would, you know, uh, give some blessings to the house like, 
because they all know each other. They know they all know their business, right? So it's like, oh, we wish you well with your new baby, or we wish you well with this and um, those types of things. And so uh, then they would go through the house and play. And literally, we're we have the instruments strapped to our bodies and we're stomping. Um, it's a really big part of that. And uh, we also sing songs and do things like that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to give it out again later, but I just want to put out the website to folks who might want to go, who are listening now, and check out um, resources on the Internet. It's kycc.net. Yes. And um, we wanted to um, put out a reminder that uh, next weekend, KYCC, um, as mentioned, will be holding their 19th annual Fall Festival, uh, which is themed this year, Watered at the Roots, Mm -hmm. a Harvest of Healing. Uh, the festival will take place at the Pauli Ballroom in the MLK Student Union at UC Berkeley, uh, Saturday, November 18th from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, Pauli Ballroom is at the front of UC Berkeley campus between Telegraph and Bancroft. And... Um, is there anything else you wanted to tell us about the fall festival, or we? Pretty yeah, much so we just wanted to be able to, you know, this is another time for folks to come around and really build that community. And one of the things, the element that's really great to that is that we've called on different um, drumming groups and groups, Pungmur groups in the Bay Area that are close to our hearts and have built this community in the Bay Area together. So we definitely want to really um, give a lot of thanks to um, Ego, which is the drumming group at UC Berkeley, and Chamrasodi, which is Sister Sound, um, the uh, women's drumming group. Um, and it's, it's, a real, it's a space that the whole family can come to and enjoy a really good, fun show. It's very collective. And um, the process is, takes all year. And you can imagine how much it would take to take bring 50 p- people together to perform and drum. And our tickets are only $18 each for general admission and $15 for students and seniors. That's a great deal. Like, mm-hmm. how many people can pay that much for a really jam-packed mm-hmm. fun show? Mm-hmm. And we just have supporters that have been with KYCC just because of Fall Festival. They've been there and were impacted and then, mm-hmm. you know, for the past 10 years have been giving, you know, because of that. So... And uh, definitely come out and enjoy that show with us. Uh, do you want to give us, I think you mentioned a couple things that are going to happen, but do you want to give us a lineup of the other festival events? Uh, yeah, so we're going to have uh, some of the pieces that we've been playing here, the songs that we've sang, we'll be performing um, that as well. We have the next piece that we're going to be playing, um, Ulim, is a, a kind of a unique piece that we choreographed together. Uh, Tohi Lee choreographed for us and brought Chamir Sodi together. And so it's a really great sound. Um, and then at the end, we come out and we play Pankut, which mm. is what we played earlier. It's a little lengthier, and there's a portion of the formation that is reminiscent of our earlier um, ethnic dance festival performance. And then at the end, we play all kinds of games with our audience and this is a time when the audience come out and dance and they get to interact with us and then they learn some games that are um, reminiscent and still played in korea in in villages and in towns and in cities and so this is a great time it's it's a fun show it's not definitely not a spectator event this is you come out and you perform with us, and so it's really right. exciting. Right on. Participation. And um, again, I just one last thing about the festival, and going back to the title, Watered at the Roots, mm. a Harvest of Healing. You know, the word healing is kind of an implication mm. that, you know, there's a need for something. There's a need for healing. So can you talk about um, what you're trying to convey with, with the, the name and, and the theme of this year's festival? Right, and I think, you know, it's sort of, it's about the cyclical process of the farming um, and sort of looking back at the 19 years that KYCC has been here and our collective personal stories. So KYCC never, like I said, it's a very collective process and all the members have a say. And so we gathered at the beginning of the year and started talking about our stories together. And uh, we shared sort of what that was for us. What has it been like to have these cycles of, you know, birth, growth, uh, harvest, and rest, sort of spring, summer, fall, winter. And we think of those things, and you know, the harvest is that time when we reap what we sowed, but winter is a time for us to heal, and we're moving into winter where we could rest and heal, and we want to be able to really give people a space to do that. And you'll see that process in our show. It moves from one individual person 
to this huge audience of hopefully 400, you know, mm-hmm. coming to a space together and performing together. And um, I think this is where we'll find healing. Mm. It's not in isolation. Mm. It's in community. And it's in this space together that we'll be able to find that healing. And we continue to water our roots because we use Pungma, we use culture as a way to like uh, build ourselves and learn who we are. I got to agree with that. And I want to thank you guys once again. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a great festival. Uh, we know that you just got some free uh, version of Pungmo on the air. But you know what? You got to come down. You got to experience it. You got to be there with these people and um, interact. Uh, okay, so we're going to go out with one last song, uh, Ulim, as uh, Liz mentioned, and enjoy this.
thank you to Elisa Gang, Samuel Kim, Dohi Lee, and Liz Suk from KYCC. If you need more information about Pung Mu Drumming or Korean Youth Cultural Center, you can check out their website at kycc.net. If you need more info on the 19th annual, you can contact KYCC at 510-652-4964. This event is wheelchair accessible. I'm going to definitely try to make it, and I think Jacob is too. So that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Tune in next week to Full Circle at 94.1 FM when we extend the conversation we're having on international politics with stories from other countries. In the meantime, you can check out our archives and po- or podcasts at kpfa.org. And special thanks to our production interns and technical interns, Ever Bolden, Juliette Cifuentes, Kyung Jin Lee, Aaron Lipovich, Pecola Taggart, Carla West, Maxine Wyman, and Frank Sterling. Our executive producers are Ranjita Giesler and Ms. M. Our senior producer is Jin Lei. Our technical director is Antonio Ortiz. And our lead segment editor is Janine Eder. Our advisor is Emilio Gonzalez. If you have any questions, give us a call at 510-848-6767, extension 627, or send an email to fullcircle at kpfa.org. With FB holding down the controls, we've been your hosts, Gil Cho and Jacob Simas. Thanks for joining us tonight on Full Circle. Stay tuned for La Onda Bajita. Hey, remember us? Youth Radio on KPFA, the latest in youth news, music, and culture. We'll be back on KPFA beginning Saturday, November 18th at 10 a.m. Be sure to tune in. In the meantime, log on to our website, www.youthradio.org, to see what we've been up to. And once again, tune in Saturday, November 18th at 10 a.m. Do you know?